welcome. Uh, this is uh, the sixth in a series of lectures and discussions on the text of A Course in Miracles. We're doing the entire text over the course of three years. We're up to <coughs> chapter four today. Uh, for those who are watching on YouTube, these lectures are being held at CRS, which is the Center for Remembering and Sharing in New York City. And if you're anywhere in the New York City area, you'd like to come join us. We're at 123, very simple address, 123 Fourth Avenue, and on the second floor. And hope you'll enjoy the presentation. All right. Let's jump into it, shall we? Yeah. First of all, I had suggested that several of you look up passages in the, this particular chapter that you like. Did some of you do that by any chance? Or anybody? Find passages. Okay, well, we'll slowly kind of look at those as we go through the through the, the afternoon, right? But first, just some introductory comments. I remember my glasses were lost in there. So, this chapter four <coughs> is all about the ego, and chapter five is we're going to find an introduction to the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of like we're, often when you have an, an opera, the opera will begin with a presentation of who the characters are in the play, right? So we're beginning to look at who the different <coughs> characters are, and obviously one of these characters, which interestingly enough is a character, which is rather a mysterious character because this character doesn't exist. <laughs> so now we add a mystery quality to the whole uh, motif, and yet it looks like it, it does exist. In fact, is it, it seems as though it's something which actually dominates our minds or dominates our thoughts, and that, that's the dreaming. That's what makes it, that makes the dream. The dream is that this character is a real character, and the truth of the matter is. So what we're really learning in the, co in the course of the course is how to become really aware of the fact that this character is not a real character, and learning how to quiet this voice, which seems to speak to us so very, very, very much. I don't know if I've ever told you this story. I, forgive me if I tell stories. Or stop me, Charles, if I did. Okay, Charles, I'll be in charge of the storytelling. <laughs> when I had the church across from Carnegie Hall and going up. All right, let me see how far I get with this. <laughs> For 13 years, I had a church uh, across the street in Carnegie Hall 57 and 7 called uh, Interfaith Fellowship. And Michael and some others, who's, anybody else who's come there? Uh, yeah, I was. Sandra used to come there, and I don't know whether this Veronica used to come. And so there's a few, believe, uh, even though that was a long time ago at this, uh, at this point, it's been 10 years since, uh, since we closed it. And I would get there early each time. Uh, just because we were really church in a box. It was really a piano recital hall more than anything else. So on Sunday afternoons after, we would have our services on Sunday morning, and then on Sunday afternoon, it would turn into a piano recital hall. So we had the finest piano. Yeah, I think it was actually tuned just about every Sunday morning. And we had a wonderful a pianist uh, as well, and a great choir, and so it was all a lot of fun for while it lasted. So I would get there early to see that everything was working, and if everything was working, I would leave. And I would go across the street, not to Carnegie Hall, but to Carnegie Deli. <laughs> and um, I would have a cup of coffee, and I would study the notes for that morning's service. And one day, I'm there, and I notice that there's a homeless fellow sitting directly across from me, having a cup of coffee. Now you can tell the homeless folks uh, for one thing, he was talking out loud to himself. You know how homeless folks talk out loud to themselves. So he's talking out loud to himself, <clears throat> and he's really loud. And there are very few people around at the time, so he's so loud that I think, you know, if I get kind of quiet and I kind of lean in, I could get a bit of a what he was saying. I could get the gist of it anyhow. Well, I did. I got most of it. I didn't get all of it, but I got enough to know what was going on. And what was going on? is that he was practicing a speech. Uh, this is like a speech that he was going to be giving, and I, it wasn't clear who it was for, but it was clear for somebody in authority. 
like a, a judge or an older brother or a sister or a parent or somebody like that. And what he was doing in this speech was that he was building a case for himself. I wouldn't help it. No, no, no. Right? He's building the case, defending himself. Did you ever do that? Yeah. Drive around your car building the case? <laughs> what you're going to say when you get in front of somebody? Oh, yeah, don't leave that out. He said that too. You know, you got to get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> projection makes perception, right? <laughs> well, a projection makes perception, and we're building the case. So this is, this is his dream. He's dreaming this dream. And in the dream, obviously, he's a victim of the world he sees. And he can't help the, the circumstances of his life, so he has a defense system that he builds up about that. Now, the truth of the matter is that we all do that. <laughs> and we all do it a great deal of time. There's, all this, there's a, a saying in Judaism that's like called having a yenta in your cap. <laughs> Right. You know what a yenta is? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, a yenta is a, a gossip monger or a, or a blabber mouth, right? And they, you all know Fiddler on the Roof. Mm -hmm. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match, find me a fine, catch me a catch, right? So that's the, <clears throat> the, the yenta was the matchmaker. See, this is before computers, there were yentas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they had together all this information about the boys and all the information about the girls, put all the information together, so that's how, it, that's how it got done, right? But that became, and there's a similar concept in Tibetan Buddhism uh, as well, which is called the Shempa. There's a, actually a, a section in the Living of Course in America that's called the Yenta and the Shempa, right? And, and then what the Shempa is, the Shempa is a hook, or it's a thought, or it's an idea that you get into your mind and you can't stop thinking about it. So you just, you start thinking, and then you, you, it actually gets worse, right? You start, you start building a case around something, and you just keeps getting more, you, you find a problem with someone out there in the world, and then you find more evidence for that, and more evidence for that, and more evidence for it. So it, it then becomes a, a real block to the awareness of love's presence. Which is really what this this chapter is about. It's, it's about helping us to become more aware of the, the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. So I'm going to read you a few of the, the sections that I kind of highlighted from. We'll just go one section at a time, and then I'll see if anybody took anything from that section, in section one and section two. So I'm reading from section one uh, for. If you got your books, I'm at. Well, actually, if you got the piece of paper. You've got it there, but if you got the book, it's you can see where it is. It's four one eight five two seven. <clears throat> you are part of reality, and I'm bold at that, right? What stands unchanged beyond the reach of your ego, but with an easy reach of spirit. When you are afraid, be still and know that God is real, and you are his beloved son, or change it to daughter if you want, or child if you want, it really doesn't matter in whom he is well pleased. Do not let your ego disrupt this, because the ego cannot know what is as far beyond its reach as you are. So this already is a lot of emphasis in this particular chapter on the fact that there's no communication. We've said this before, but let's reiterate it. There's no communication between the ego and Holy Spirit, or spirit. There can't be. The spirit does not recognize the ego, because if the spirit recognized the ego, that would mean that there was an ego to be recognized. But seeing how there's this thing is an illusion, there's nothing for it to recognize, how can you see something which isn't even there, <clears throat> right? On the other hand, the ego doesn't recognize spirit, because if the ego recognized spirit, that would be the end of the ego. It would be done for. But the Course says about what even though ego doesn't recognize spirit, what it does do is suspect. It suspects that there's something else, right? <clears throat> and there's something, there's something more, there's something beyond it. Now that, that makes the ego very afraid because, again, that would mean the death of the ego should that be true. But on the other hand, as we grow in our understanding of the Course, 
it actually makes us quite delighted and quite happy to know that there's something else that, that really is. <clears throat> in fact, it, it, early on in this particular chapter, uh, the Course uses, and it's the only time he uses, only says this phrase once in the entire Course, your other life. Isn't that interesting it uses that phrase, your other life? It, it does at other times talk about your kingdom and things like that, or your creations, but this is the only time you actually use the phrase your other life. And of course, the, <clears throat> not just the implication, the implication is that the other life is the real life the only life that there is, which again makes this whole experience a dream that at some point we will awaken from. And if at no other point, uh, certainly that becomes much easier once we let go of the body because, as the Course says, the body is the ego's chosen home. And on the ego level, we are very, very, very identified with these bodies. Uh, we do indeed believe that this is exactly who we are. Uh, but the good, the good news is that it's not who you are, and there's a simple proof of that fact, which is that nobody lasts. <laughs> uh, they all disappear. Uh, there's, there's the oldest person in the world right now is 116, and that's not really too old. Chanti's trying to beat the record, but she's doing pretty good so far. <laughs> <laughs> So, we're learning progressively how to think. We're, 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 what the Course is about might help us to change our mind. So the mind is working in such a way that we are not thinking within this ego realm, but we're thinking with the mind in line with the mind of spirit. So we're switching over. And the good news is that you can do it. And actually, as we get into this, this chapter here, you'll see some of the ways that it's suggesting the things that we should do to to make that switch. Um, up at the top of the right hand column, another quote from the course, <laughs> also from this section. Yet his home will stand forever and is ready for you when you come when you choose to enter it. Of this you can be wholly certain. God is as incapable of creating the perishable as the ego is of making the eternal. <laughs> Now, at the same time that that's true, the ego will try to make the eternal, even though it can't do it. Uh, perhaps one of the best ways, the most absurd ways in which this has ever been done, is to look at the pyramids in Egypt. Now, these are tombs which are created for individual men. I mean, these are monuments, right? So this is one of the ways that the ego can make itself eternal is that it gets its name carved on a building somewhere, or on a tombstone somewhere, or uh, on a, a bridge named after it, or uh, an auditorium at a college somewhere. Like it's a good thing I got that lid on there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, last time it was a glass of water and it went flying. <laughs> um, so if there's any ways that we, that we could try to make ourselves, quote, famous so that the name would last. But, but, what's, but what, is, what is it to have a name that lasts? I mean, that's, it's just a name. It's not, it's not you. And, and who among us would even know if we knew that person? And what, what would it mean to even have known? Does anybody know who Einstein was? I mean, we all know who Einstein was, but <laughs> you know, there's nobody alive who probably can remember, actually knew Einstein. There's a thing called the second death. Do you know about the second death? The second death, the first death is when you die, and the second death is when the last person who's alive on the planet can remember you. <laughs> Dies. <laughs> now you're really dead. <laughs> it's official. But people talk about being being remembered, and of course, so that's you know, being remembered is not. That's nothing. <laughs> What, what is it to be, who, who's remembering, or what are they remembering? And even if they could remember, do they remember anything at all like the truth of what, of what is? There's a point in this chapter where it says, we all make up an ego. And not only do all we all make up an ego, we also all make up egos for each other. So we, we create ego ideas about who the other one is. So now we've got two false uh, concepts working on, the, the false concepts about who we think we are ourselves, 
and the Paul's concept about who we think other people are, all of which is just a continuation. Dylan? Yeah, I have to bring up what I was going to say last night. You ever see the movie Total Recall? Total Recall. Uh, no, Schwarzenegger. I'm Schwarzenegger, right. Arnold Schwarzenegger, it made in 1990. I never really seen the whole movie, but if you put the TV on, it was like the scene from Across America. The, the wife is trying to kill Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he says, what are you doing? You're my wife. And he said, she said, no, we have an implant. You're like from Mars. You're not real. She said, you're a dream. And he said, who am I? And she said, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was like, I never seen that. <laughs> Again, today. Yeah, right, that's great, that's <laughs> But who you really are, of course, is that you are this other self. I mean, you are spirit. And that, that fact is that's one of the workbook lessons in the course is I am spirit. And that, so we're, that's actually kind of an affirmation that we're making where we're moving over to that very clear definition or realization, which really helps a lot because, you know, the, the ego is very frightened of the loss of the body. I mean, that's our big fear, right? The big fear is you're going to die. Big deal. <laughs> I mean, really be, be happy that we're not going to have to hold on to this thing forever, especially as it gets old and sick and diseased and tired and worn out. I mean, we forget to the point where we're really let it, ready to let it go. David? Well, I think part of the ego strategy on this uh, ego and eternity is... Uh, most religions, um, the dogma of most religions is that if we're good boys and girls, we'll go to heaven. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that's part of the ego strategy. Right. So I always believe um, and that. But then even there, we're thinking about, and this is where the Course is very different from a lot of other uh, traditions. You're still having a body in heaven. I mean, you still see yourself as having a body in heaven, and that's not what the Course is saying at all. There's no, there's no you in that physical sense. Of this. There's no physical dimension to this thing at all. This is why it, makes, this is, it requires a leap in our consciousness to be able to understand that the, that the Course is talking about something that's formed less. Actually, I just got to, I was in California for a couple of weeks since I've seen you, and Doing a lot of driving, we spent a lot of time to listen to CDs, and I listened to a, a CD by a fellow. I'm studying up on all the death experiences because it's the next thing I want to write about. And this was um, a, a fundamentalist minister who wrote a book called 90 Minutes in Heaven. Did some of you read, read the book? And his heaven, it, there's actually pearly gates and streets of gold. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, he actually sees pearly gates and streets. And I don't doubt that this guy had a death experience. Uh, it, it's like all the other death experiences. It, seemed, it was really quite genuine, I felt. But he's seeing <laughs> streets of gold and pearly gates, which is, you might expect him to see. And there's also, you know, there's one by a six-year-old boy who yeah. died. Yeah. Have you ever read that one? Yes. 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 Okay, so, and his father is a, is a minister in... Nebraska, and he sees Jesus with a gold crown and a, and a purple robe and sitting on a throne. Right, and which which really leads to there's a section in the course, and we'll get to this in more detail later, I think, where it talks about the borderland, right? And it's not clear what the borderland is, but there's like this implication that there's this this place some kind of between this and heaven, which we're calling the borderland, which I think is probably this. This in-between world where we're kind of seeing what we expect to see yeah. until such a time as our, our thought. Now, when you read Anita Morjani's book, uh, Dying to Be Me, she's not a Christian. Uh, she's a Hindu, and so she doesn't see that. You know, she doesn't see, although she does kind of have an affection for Jesus and all that, at, at the same time that that's true, hers is really much more this formless kind of, feeling level experience of what's really going on this this kind of the sense of, of beingness. She even talks about being, I think I quoted in this uh, section here, being God, which would be blasphemous in some areas, but that and and some people think the course is kind of blasphemous when it when it says that same sort of a thing. But it's not being blasphemous at all. It's just recognizing the truth, the reality of who we really are. 
block. Pardon? Chips. Chip off the old block. That's what I'm not sure you look at. <laughs> <laughs> so on the bottom of page one, I, I do just lift out some definitions of what the ego is based on this particular chapter. Or these are welcome all over in this chapter. So the ego is not the self. So the self, we can kind of equate with, with spirit here. So there's a re that's the other you that really is. It is only an idea, not a fact. There's no truth to this. It's just an idea. <clears throat> it's in a wrong-minded attempt to perceive yourself as you wish to be, rather than as you are. So it's a wish. So a wi what is a wish? A wish is a fantasy, right? <laughs> a fantasy doesn't have any reality, right? It is the questioning aspect of the post-separation self which was made rather than created. So it's a, it's a dream, uh, etc. Right? Let's go on to page two. Uh, you have to turn all the way to page two. Page two. This, uh, to the ego, the ego is God. And the ego rules, and the ego is looking to be in control and in charge at all times. I love this quote from Ramdas, which actually, uh, Larry, yeah, uh, sent me this one. Didn't you send me this, Larry? In most of our human relationships, we spend much of our time mm -hmm. reassuring one another that the costumes of identity are on strict. <laughs> So this is the mask. Uh, so we want to be sure that the mask is is fitting properly. Right. Going, everyone makes an ego for himself, which is subject to enormous variations because of the instability. He also makes an ego for everyone else he perceives, which is equally variable. We just said that a moment ago. Your own state of mind is a good example of how the ego was made. When you threw knowledge away, it's as if you've never had it. So let's talk about that for a second. The Course is very clear. So if there's a self that you are, that's real, that's always been your capital S self, which is also spirit, that's equated with knowledge. You had this knowledge. Now for some reason, we threw that away. We, we abandoned. Now that's one of the most difficult questions the Course addresses this in this particular section. Why would we, why would we throw this away? And the answer is, and the answer is never, never a good answer, because it's, it's always an insufficient answer, even though you can provide an answer. You know, if we wanted to do it on our own, uh, it comes out of arrogance or hubris or pride <coughs> to think that we, that's what the story of the prodigal son is all about, it's really all about our running away from home, our leaving God, our saying thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to go off on my own. And God doesn't stop us because God can't stop us. As we've talked about that in a previous session, just to reiterate what that idea is a little bit. Remember the quote from the last chapter, if I intervene between your thoughts and their results, I would be violating the most basic law there is in the universe. The most basic law there is in the universe is the law of cause and effect. So God can't change our thought processes for us. It can give us the right information. And that's the mean that we are always a decision point in terms of whether or not we will receive or accept that information. And you are always being given the right information. So it's up to you whether you're going to acknowledge it. Okay. Let's go on a little further. A question? Yes. Uh, would, would you say then that God doesn't really ever experience any of our mm -hmm creations or dreams, in other words, even in our loving the right. goodness we might do. I, I somehow had the idea that God would experience our joy in, uh, right. in some no. way, but you're, of course, you're saying no. No, but God knows you're dreaming. God knows we're His children. God knows God loves us. Uh, God knows that God has set up a plan for our salvation. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all the so the pathway home is, is really good. But it's not necessary to know the details of your dream. Hmm. Uh, look, remember, I think in a previous session we talked about five. If you think about the fact that there are 
7 billion people on the planet having eight dream cycles a night. That's 56 dreams, 66, 56 billion dreams per night, most of which are nonsense. And our dreams are still nonsense, even though we might try to make a lot of sense out of them. So it really doesn't matter. The, the only thing that matters is a, there's a self that you really are. God loves you. God knows that you're coming home. God's already set up a pathway for you to get home, and you will get home, and as a matter of fact, you've already done it. I mean, as a matter of fact, it, it's the, the story is over. It's complete. It's finished. It's through. And that's because there's no time. <laughs> because time itself would be illusion. So that's, that just adds to the dream, the, the, the thought that it's possible for us to think a thought outside of the mind of God. It's impossible to think a thought outside of the mind of God. But trying to think a thought outside of the mind of God is the thing which has given rise to this whole world and every dimension of it, all of which is a fantasy. So what the Course is all about, <laughs> it's really it's just about waking up. It's just about waking, you know, it's just like we wake up in the morning. And when you wake up in the morning, the first thing that happens when you wake up in the morning is you recognize <coughs> You were sleeping, right? So, but but now the, and you were dreaming, and now the sleeping and the dreaming are over in that sense, mm -hmm. and so now we're getting on with capital L life. Larry, did you want to say something? To do it well, I'm just. It's hard for me to picture anything, any definition of God that isn't completely conscious of everything. If the book contains all the pages and all the sentences and all the words in the book, and I'm only able to focus on one or two at a time because right. of the limits of my human mind, I cannot then say, well, God is less aware than I am. God has the entire book already been written, already closed. Now the book is not aware even though it contains all of those words and all of those sentences. Right. But if the book were God to me, then the book would be conscious. So, so, okay, so there's, the, there's there, all right, look, we talked about this a little bit last time, so let's look at the, the, and this is very important, this is a bit of a difference between the Course and some other philosophies, um, is, can, concerns the worst use of the word conscious. Or conscious aware. Conscious, aware, that's, that's right? Evil. So, when it says, it says consciousness was the first split that was entered into the mind, right? And so the first split that's entered into the mind is the idea is of subject-object. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, it's the idea that there is an other, that, or that there's an outside. Of course it's saying that there's nothing outside of you, outside of your mind. And mind is, is the only thing which is really real. Because everything else, among other things else, disappears. So there's no, it has no eternity. Only the thing which is eternal is real. Only things which last are real. <coughs> Knowledge is real. Truth is real. Eternity is real. That's all quite real. It's the, actually the only thing there, that there is. Everything else just disappears. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a dream or a fantasy. Well, that's why the yeah. drop in the ocean yes. metaphor works very well for me. Yes, the drop in the ocean is, is a great metaphor because it just disappears once it goes back into the ocean. But then I guess I think, well, <coughs> is the awoke, does the ocean contain knowledge of its potential to be infinite? You know, I think it's, it's, it's difficult for us to, and if anybody's got any better suggestions than this, it's really difficult for us to, to talk and to know about what the knowledge thing is. Exactly. Okay? Because first of all, as we've said in the past, we can't define God. Uh, so we can't really put words into this, and we can't put a form of description into it. But the main thing that we do know is it's an experience that's quite real. Just like, as we've said before, love is an experience which is quite real. And we know that there is such a thing as love. Everybody here would testify to the fact there's something called love. That's one of the basic definitions we have for God, that God is love. And we really, we believe that. And we don't we just believe that, we know that. We actually know that that is true. You could say that we trust that. The first characteristic of a teacher of God that's in the manual of the teachers of the Course in Miracles is, is trust. So we trust that, but we not just trust that. We also, at a deeper level, know that that's true. That's really what we're all doing here. I mean, what we're all doing here is 
we're really seeking to remember or recognize what we already know. So we already know this, and we already know, that's why there's this, the ego suspects, I read there a moment ago, the ego suspects that there's something, something more and something that doesn't want to look at it, because it would be the end of the ego if it did look at it. But we all suspect that that's true, and what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're trying to go deeper into understanding what that is actually as an experience, not as, as an, just as an intellectual thing, but as, a, as an experience of that truth. That's what made me get really excited about reading Anita Marjani's book, uh, Dying to Be Me, because in her book, she's really describing this as an experience that she had. So once you, once you read about the experience and you, and you think about it in terms of the intellect and understanding what the Course is saying, and we're putting both of these together, then it gets really, really exciting. Well, as, as it is for anybody who has a, any kind of experience of... We talk a lot about mysticism. We're gonna, I'm doing these lectures on mysticism at the uh, Open Center pretty soon, by the way, if you, if you want to come to that. And what a mystical experience is an experience. It's all, and one of the basic characteristics of a mystical experience is called ineffability, which means that we can't describe what it's about. But we, we know that it's true. In fact, as Anita Morjani, it is this typical kind of thing, actually even Alexander does in his book too, and a lot of the others do. Actually, the 90 Minutes in Heaven fellow did as well. Uh, they all say it's more real. It's so much more real than this thing that we call life. And, and that's very exciting to hear it. And, and it's not just a little bit more real. You know, it's, it's put a whole bunch of zeros. It's the, it's the, only, thing. the only thing that there is. Yes, that's true. Uh, yes. Uh. <clears throat> I, I read all those books too and I love them. And what struck me especially about the Anita Morjani book was when she spent some time in the, the other side. She was dying from cancer and they came back and she right. was cured of cancer. But they, they, the hospital wanted to take extra precautions because they couldn't quite believe it. So the nurses come in with the hazmat suits because she's getting heavy you know, chemotherapy radiation, which is you know, dangerous to somebody healthy. And she says, you can, you can treat me. I'll be fine. And she, because of her certainty, the drugs didn't touch her, didn't make her sick. She just, right. that, that, that was amazing to me. Right. Well, you hear other reports of similar things. To that. You know, the song of Ram Dass with his guru in India and with the LSD, and he gives him this yeah. huge oh, yeah. amount. Enough and to drop a horse and, and nothing. nothing. Right, nothing. Right. Which just goes to prove it's all where the mind's at, mm -hmm. and it's not where the body's at that and matters in the long <coughs> And that normally would come from such fear, that's what made her sick in the first place. Right. That doesn't mean we should go around doing risky things with our bodies. <laughs> you know, just to test out the theory. Because, uh, but that's tremendous faith. Christian. Just wondering, when we pray, is that to a creation of the ego? Well, it could be. I, mean, I think you know, a lot of times it probably is. But then that's not what we would think of as real prayer. So what is real prayer? It, communion, the Course says. Mm -hmm. Communication. Mm -hmm. Where the, it's where we're actually in dialogue. Not necessarily something that's verbal, but this, the connection is, is being affirmed. That we're, we're receiving and, and giving. It's going back and forth. Yes, uh, Don? So I'm just going back to um, the idea I'm always being given the right information. Yes. I'm, I'm always God guided. <coughs> so the oneness and right-mindedness is always available to me. Right. So, so then I take that further and I'm, I say to myself, okay, so I could have the experience of Jesus or Buddha if I could remove the blocks to that. That's right. And let's say I did that. So okay. that's still the dream. It, it would still be a dream. <coughs> the dream, what are you saying, the dream is that you've done that or...? Well, if I'm here, physically here in the, world. In, in the body, it doesn't matter how, <coughs> I'm asking I guess, does it matter if I'm connected to my right mind or one-mindedness, right. I'm still in the dream because I'm still here. Yes. I understand yeah. the question. Is, that, is right. that? Well, we do talk about, we do believe that there are, quote, enlightened beings, right? Mm -hmm. 
so, which would be to be fully realized. Right. So we, but we don't think of the too many. Right. Uh, but, but, but we say Jesus is no doubt that way, and Buddha, and perhaps others that we don't know. Actually, there is a little section in the Manual for Teachers, in the, or the Clarification in terms of the back of the Course, which talks about what that would be like. And it actually, when it talks about it, it says, we can't talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> because this is so far beyond it actually even says something about it. If you were to actually achieve that state, you might not be long in the body yourself. Mm -hmm. yes. right? Because why would you be even wanting to hold on to part of the illusion? Right? Sometime, I'll, I'll dig that out and read it for you next time. Amy? I, I had an interesting <coughs> experience this last week. Um, I happened to be reading with a Christian group the first two chapters of Genesis. And I noticed, or first three, anyway, I noticed that it says that um, God threw us out of Eden because if we stayed around, we would become immortal. I mean, that's not exactly what it says, but right. that's what it implies. And I was really struck by that because I had never seen it before. And... Um, so I have a friend who is a Hasidic rabbi, and I went to him and I said, can you explain this to me, what does it mean? And first of all, he made fun of me for asking in a very Christian way, because that's some, the, the right way to do it, but anyway. Uh, but basically, what he said was, yeah, and that God had thrown us out of Eden as you might throw an adolescent out of your fancy house because they were having <laughs> drunken orgies or you know yeah. carving their names in the fancy tapestry or whatnot right. and it wasn't that you ceased to love this child but they just needed to go off on their own and I didn't talk about the prodigal son because that's a Christian story, story yeah. but um, it made me think of it and finally I said are you telling me that God has a sense of humor mm -hmm. and he said oh yeah sure and, and that had just never occurred to me, um, but that would be a way that he could survive us. Well, actually, <laughs> no. in, in terms of the Course, that never happened. Yes. Uh, God never threw us out of anything. Uh, we, we, we left by our own election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So we decided to, to say goodbye and to run off on our own rather than... God couldn't do that. Why would, why would God separate himself from us? We, we, our experience of separation is that we have separated ourselves. Well, yeah, I mean, what, yeah. What, but basically what he said was, he said, if you want to behave that way, you will have to, I mean, that's not quite the same as throwing it. No. The Course is so very clear, God does not condemn. That's an exact yeah. three sentence, I mean, three word sentence, yeah. because God does not condemn, right? But he and did, yeah. Nor would he ever cast us out. It's, it's, a, it's a myth, it's a good myth. Mm -hmm. Because it really helps us to understand a great deal about what kind of did happen. We actually went over that, I think, the second session of class, or maybe the first session of class. Lily Katz? So the one thing that um, you said was something about if you, if you don't leave, if you don't leave, you would be immortal. If you don't leave, you would be immortal? Oh. Well, in, in, in a way that... that well, you are yeah, 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 that's what I mean. So it's yeah. like, right. so that's... Okay, I got it. You wouldn't agree to go. So, but that's in the fall, falling into the dream means that you're not immortal. Because you're having a dream that you're not immortal. You're, it would, in fact, is that's the main identification that the, the body, I mean, the e ego body has, that it that's, it's proof of the fact that there's no God, actually, because I'm a body and I'm going to die. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when, right. you, when, you, when you're telling that story, something that popped in my head is that, you know, when we raise questions such as that, and when people talk of that, you know, we have to be willing to remember that if perfect love is God, mm -hmm. then there's nothing outside of perfect love. So right. if, if God were to have judged a mm -hmm. son to throw him out of his mansion, so to speak, then God was believing in condemnation. Right. So there's no such thing anymore as perfect love and there's no such thing as a God. There's a God of fear now. So perfect love is perfect love. It's without a condition. 
Yeah, well, basic, basically what he said was you can choose to do that. Yeah. But if you do that, then you're not, you don't fit here anymore. And that's, I think, what we did. We decided we wanted to experience. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to reinforce what Brad was saying, there's a line of course says, God created you perfect. Okay, and that's and you are perfect. In fact, that's what the, my next book is coming out in April is about being really <laughs> perfect. Yes. Um, just relating to the course perspective on it, everything that's being said here, uh, according to Jesus, and what's pretty obvious, like as Brad just said is that the infinite perfect creative mind of this universe, which is love, doesn't know, there. the whole reason we're experiencing this and it's a dream is that we are entertaining a belief that there could be another will or a power that could oppose God. I chose to eat of that tree and I've got to stop entertaining that belief upon which time when I'm sick enough of the results exactly. of my own little rebellion right. and dream that I can separate myself and create myself. I mean, that's the that's what sin is. It's right. the idea that I can self-create apart from source, unlike source, and that's all that's happening here. And the perspective that the right. rabbi expressed is obviously a very human hmm. perspective right. of right and wrong and good and bad, which God knows nothing of. Right. God yeah, only knows cool. God's creation the mind of God. And mm. even in the Bible, which is a very mixed bag, <laughs> it does say that the mind of God and one part of parts of it are inspired and true scripture. And it does say that the mind of God is too pure to behold evil. Right. Which is the same perspective. Right. Okay, one at a time. Uh, just and Okay. I just want to say one thing about the way way I find what's happening here the mind of God. Um, you know, everything that's happening here is of the ego. That's where we are. We're, we're hanging out in the ego. And what we're all trying to really understand is this other, as the Course clearly says, it's the reversal of the way we now think. Right. So all of our arguments are coming from where we're rooted. Right. Right. Now we have to start to pull up some of the weeds that are still left. And <coughs> And it's okay to play around with this arena, but you've got to get some basic concepts of God is an idea, and I am an idea also. So here we have a similarity right off the bat. Now, taking it another step, taking it another step, if I could just look at the concept of perfection, it's, oh, it's out of my realm. It really is. I have to take it on faith. I do. Because I, I don't know what. What what is real? I don't know what is truth. I don't unless I know. And then that, and John know. says it over yeah. again. <laughs> it's 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 so a, it's trust. But the word ineffable. What does ineffable mean? It means they can't put anything put into words. That's what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. Okay, right. <laughs> we're trying to make the ineffable effable. <laughs> well, there's this next part we're going about okay. looking at stuff. This, what we're doing is we're learning. We're trying to learn. I hear Diana I heard you saying. Uh, a lot. I want to know. I want to know what this says. I mean, I want to know what this says so clearly that I can live this, and I, and I can I can live this all the time, so that I'm I'm not walking around with a mind that's that's in doubt or, or lacking in faith or lacking in trust. And and I do believe that there that I am give, being given the right information. If I so, but what we're, what we're doing is we're learning it. And what you were saying is that, you know, at some point, as Helen, as Bill said to Helen, there's got to be another way. <laughs> I mean, there really has to be another way to do this. That's why the Course talks about what it calls a reversal in thinking. We literally have to reverse the thinking process that we're doing and stop building the world. And when we stop building the world, that's like trying to find eternity for the ego, right, in the world. Stop building the world and just simply realize that the kingdom of heaven is already here. <laughs> and it's all, it, there's a line of the course that says, heaven is here, there's no place else. Heaven is now, there's no other time. So that makes it a very mystical experience, but hey, that's what we're looking for, actually. <laughs> Nothing is higher than... A, mystical experience. I mean, and falling in love is a mystical experience. 
Yeah, uh, uh, Sam, did you had your hand up first? Uh, I'm sitting here. Shanti just said something that was very inspiring to me. Um, <coughs> I was raised as an Orthodox Jew. Studied the Talmud for 20 years. Became a psychologist, philosopher. My whole training is about the union of opposites, synthesis. How do I reconcile knowledge, such as the Course, with everything else that I've learned? With the Hasidic rabbi who talked about being expelled from the garden. Right. It ain't happening. No, it ain't, no, it ain't, it ain't happening. happening. No, it ain't happening. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Right. Every time I run into this, I want to make it different. I want right. to make Stop it happen. It. <laughs> I want to make a synthesis from these two opposites. You can't make a synthesis. I want to. Well, I'm desperate. <laughs> Someone please shoot me. <laughs> keep doing this. Keep my ego wants it so badly. Say, but look, there's an opening there. You yeah, see, no. you could try. No. No, let's see, this is where the cook. I grew up studying Jungian psychology. I love Jungian psychology. I still love, it, love Jungian psychology. But the resolution, the opposites concept, it just doesn't work. You know, there is, there is no resolution of opposites. I mean, God is wholly real, and the illusion is wholly an illusion. I mean, we can't. We, we can't reconcile those two. That's why, again, also in terms of the Course in America, the thing we mentioned before, the, the mind-body problem, which has yeah. been a dominant theme in, in philosophy, that's not a problem in the Course, because the Course is very clear. No body, all mind. Period. Simple. <coughs> right? <laughs> that you're, you're not a body. If there's anything that the Course is really clear about. But that's a tremendous amount of relief. The relief is you don't have to try to resolve this. Just accept no the truth. relief yet, John. But I'll let you know. <laughs> that's what working on the that's, working that's, on the relief. Well, that's the problem. It's in your head. Did I mention yes. yin and yang too? No, I didn't. No, let's not, let's not throw that in. No, let's leave it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and and just um, just on that uh, <coughs> the whole. The whole workbook trains us in the practice of not trying to fix or change or perfect this false, yeah. illusory not I that we are so addicted and attached to identifying with and holding in place. And it teaches us to let that go over and over and over again. The only way out is to realize from a reference point beyond the illusion that I am not this and nothing and no yeah. one is this. Yeah. So the only way out, it's not by, um, you don't develop the ego into the Holy Son of God, you lay it off like, right. a, like the snake sheds its skin. Right. And, or this torn, shabby, smelly right. garment that you know, you're just done with. Right. that contains all loss, all hurt, all harm, all, su all suffering, all sickness, all death, all limitation, all idea of loss, all of that, war, conflict, everything. Uh, you just take it off and no, I never was that. And so anyway, and the, the thing I had wanted to say originally was when you're talking about the kingdom is here and Jesus says the kingdom is you, you are the kingdom of heaven, what the ego is, is it's almost like a smoke machine. It's like, and he talks in some of the meditations about the clouds, and we can't see the light and the love that we are because ego is constantly spinning these clouds of uh, grievance and projecting images which are the veil or are the screen uh, which blind us to our own reality. It actually uses the phrase smoke and mirrors in the. Yeah, so it's like it's like a spider just yeah. constantly weaving the web of illusion, right. and and the way out is just to stop doing that, as you were saying, John. You, right. you just learn how to stop, yeah, <laughs> not stop do it. that anymore. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, just real quick. Um, there's relief, I think, when you realize you're not Tremendous a body. Tremendous relief. There's yeah. a, a line from the work workbook. Uh, yeah. I'm not a body. I'm free because oh, I'm still this guy. Right. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. That's why this is such exciting material. I mean, the what this is because it is it is this, this freedom mm -hmm. that you recognize that, that just doesn't exist in any other system unless it's a system which is very similar to the system like the Vedanta system or something. Now let's go a little further and then we'll take a break here in about five minutes. Um, up on the right hand side of the second page, um, a couple of quotes from the course. To be egocentric is to be dispirited, but to be self-centered in the right sense is to be inspired or in spirit. The truly inspired are enlightened and cannot invite <coughs> darkness. So there's your enlightenment that you're looking for, Don. Right? I'm going on. You can speak from the spirit or from the ego as you choose. It's all a matter of choice. If you speak from spirit, you have chosen to be still and know that I am God. These words are inspired because they reflect knowledge. That's a real knowledge. If you speak from the ego, you are disclaiming knowledge instead of affirming it and are thus dispiriting yourself. And we know when we do that. We know when we are dispiriting. Yeah. Actually, uh, in the next section, we're going to look at some of the ways in which we can become clear about <coughs> when it is that we're really really in ego so that we can then stop it. And we actually, we already know, but we're not really, we're talking about getting more aware or more conscious of, of when we're off course so we don't just wallow around to being off course. Right? And going on to all of it, the, staying on page two. This is about, this is the first section is on right teaching and right learning. The lessons you have taught yourself have been so over learn and fix that they raise like heavy curtains to obscure the simple and the obvious. This is actually very, very simple. And the Course says of itself several times that this is a very simple course. People want to know why it's so difficult or it's so complex. And it's not, it's, the problem is that we're difficult and we're complex. And we, we're, we're, we're trying to think that there's something complex and diff difficult here when it's not even here at all. Um, let's see, we're going a little bit further on page top of three. So we're starting now to, to look about how we <coughs> deal with this ego thing, and just a couple of headlines there. Uh, as you said earlier, <coughs> it's not about fixing the ego. Uh, attack never works. Never attack an ego, mm -hmm. um, because if you attack an ego. Uh, you're going to get attacked back. Uh, just, just you can just assume that that's that that's what's going to happen, right? There's a very interesting passage. I was listening to the this chapter on CD driving in the, this morning, where it says, my, so "I would like to, I'm going to look this up and do the exact words." It says something about never attack an ego, but at the same time, you would never attack an ego. You do want to uphold the truth. So the the question is, how do you uphold the truth? <laughs> and not attack an ego. That's, that's an interesting process that we, because so much of the time we think, well, we're defending the truth, but our defense of the truth, what we think is the truth, is going to appear to be an attack on the part of, on the attack of an ego. Right? Well, it's also talking about an attack. What is an attack? What is an attack? Yeah, really. I mean, well, it depends on how it's perceived. I mean, you may not think of it as an attack, but the ego will perceive it as being an attack, and you have to be really aware that that's probably going, probably going to happen. So when it is aware of that, then you know that you're an ego really heavily opposing. Right. I mean, the, one of the seems to me the problem that we continue to have, and that the course is trying to eliminate from being a problem, is that we train our mind not to keep repeating the same errors. We have to have a lot more humility to see that we are using any time we come up with a negative, either towards ourselves or towards another, just stop and look at it, that's all, and resolve it into a positive. And that'll happen. It does. It's it does. Guaranteed. It takes a lot of stopping what and a lot happens? of looking, yes. which is what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Sometimes you got to let the baby cry. Sometimes you got to let the baby cry. Yeah, and then yeah, that's an interesting that phrase. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, sometimes you let the baby cry because it's this what one of the choices you have. You let the baby cry. And then you laugh. Yeah. And babies cry. Yeah. And then you laugh. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you laugh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, Diane. You say here, 
uh, look for the good in everyone you see, look for the light within. All right. Is this looking done with the Holy Spirit? Or is of course. This, you know, so when you say look, yes. the Holy Spirit. Right. Of course, it has to be with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> sure. Did you want to say something, Eric? Yeah. It just <coughs> strikes me that uh, uh, I want to be looking at the perfection of everything that happens. Mm. And the things that I think I like, they seem perfect. And the things that I think I don't like, they don't seem perfect, but they are perfect. Right. There isn't, there isn't anything to be fought. And if I think I need to fight this thing, because this thing is wrong, right, this resist thing is it. bad, then I'm I'm out of presence, I'm out of happy presence. That's right. And that's where, that's my primary, to be in happy presence. Right. Very, very good. Thank you. And I'm going to hand back there to uh, Brad, and then we'll Yeah, um, this whole thing, every, up, up until this very point, I'm seeing something very fundamental in all of this. Um, it's really quite beautiful. You, you were just explaining how simple this is. You know, Jesus is really telling us in chapter 4, over and over and over, this is what you believe, and I'm here to tell you the truth. So, all I'm asking of you is to be willing to stop analyzing and to accept what I'm telling you is truth if you would like to have peace. And you will, you will know which is true by the evidence of the guide that you have chosen, because if you're at peace, you've chosen the right guide. Right. All right, let's go <clears throat> a little bit further. Um, I'm on page three, <clears throat> left-hand side. <clears throat> I will never attack your ego, but I am trying to teach you how its thought system arose. When I remind you of your creations, your ego cannot but respond with fear. <coughs> so that's why this whole course, this will be a textbook, a workbook, and a manual for teachers because this is actually a learning. And as the Course says, you have been very poorly taught. And seeing how we've been very poorly taught, <coughs> we have to literally not only relearn the lesson, we have to overlearn. You know what overlearning is? It's a concept in education. So. Uh, overlearning is that you, you learn it, and then after you get it, you have to go back over it again. It's like you learn how to play a piece, piece on a piano, and you get it all 100% right, and then you keep practicing. <laughs> uh, so that you really get it right. So, and, but in this case, it's talking about how we, we put these principles into practice in our life, and then we really put these principles to practice in our life, so we keep and one of the little things that we, that we do is we keep noticing <coughs> little places where we you, you, you stumble on the keys a little bit or something, and you, you make a mistake. And so that's why I said the first day of class, I think, <coughs> what this is all about is just consistently raising our awareness. So we're consistently raising our awareness. So that it's just less and less and less likely that we will be making those wrong ego-oriented choices. This is a, it's a hard habit to break. And we have to kind of admit <coughs> that we are all literally addicted uh, to this thing that we call an ego. Uh, just be honest about it, we're very addicted. And so breaking this habit is not going to be an easy thing to do. The good news is, as with all bad habits, we can break them. And we can start seeing things uh, another way. Going on to the, the next uh, little section from the course there. You dream of a separate ego and believe in a world that rests upon it. This is very real to you. You cannot undo it by not changing your mind about it. If you are willing to renounce the role of guardian, you see I'm underlying this, of your thought system and open it to me, I will correct it very gently and lead you back to God. So again, it's all a matter of willingness on our part, you know, our willingness to <coughs> allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to, to be the guide. And keep in mind, of course, as the ego always speaks first. So when it comes to any of our decision makings, we, we look at what the ego's choice is, 
and then we allow for some sobriety and we say no thank you and then we <coughs> ask the Holy Spirit guidance I mean you, you that's why the course spends a lot of time talking about wrong-minded and right-minded thinking and so we're, we're slowly letting go of the wrong-minded thinking we're adopting the right-minded thinking up to the point which only the right mind can lead us to our eventual goal which is one mind one minded we got to get to right mindedness to get to, we got to practice living in right mindedness long enough to allow one mindedness to become <coughs> our experience on a permanent basis, right? Uh, going a little further, <coughs> let's jump down to the last paragraph, I mean the last book on page three on the left. Nothing you do or think or wish or make is necessary to establish your worth. This point is not debatable except in delusion. Your ego is never at stake because God did not create it. Your spirit is never at stake because he did. So it's, we're not destroying anything here. We're not attacking anything here. The only thing that we're ever doing is just letting go of an illusion, right? And then let's look a little bit at fulfilling your function. Where it says you are not at peace because you are not fulfilling your function. Lesson 64 is let me not forget my function. Uh, another way to say, is, say that is to say, let me not wander into temptation. Wandering into temptation would be looking at the wrong-minded choices and kind of going with whatever the wrong-minded choices are. So what is our function? Function is it's not hiding, <coughs> it's not judging, it's not even, as some of you said earlier, assessing, correcting, fixing, or suggesting an attitude adjustment on the part of somebody else, right? It's always forgiveness. <clears throat> and, and all forgiveness ever means, of course, is just letting it go. Not create an issue where there is no issue. If I, make, if I make something an issue, then it's an issue in my mind, and my mind is the thing which is stuck. It's not necessarily have anything to do with what's going on in the external world at all. Right? Yes. I have a question about that. Uh, there's big examples of what I'm going to ask about and very small ones that we sure. deal with in our lives. So, when Martin Luther King is looking at, and not just Martin Luther King, but many are looking at the gross injustice like of, um, you know, some human beings act behaving in ways and having a society structured to disenfranchise and uh, disrespect oh, other human beings and you know saying it mildly right. and there's this deep feeling something's terribly wrong that it is not always the perspective of love to overlook that or let that go and I get confused about that sometimes because there's this call to constantly forgive, overlook, and let go. And yet sometimes, and I'm, you know, I'm particularly asking the question of your yeah. perspective on that because I'm dealing with my own little mini version right now, and I've been mm -hmm. really resisting communicating because the five egos involved that I need to communicate with are going to not like my bringing certain things to their attention where they did not properly take care of what really needed to be well yeah, so. taken care of and, and it needs to be I need to call everything to um, to rightness okay. oh, sorry. And, and so how do we hold this perspective of forgiveness and overlooking all of that when sometimes we do need to address and, and I just want to say in, I think it's in the psalm of prayer or psychotherapy Jesus says um, that I uh, that we share, like the miracle, miracle workers are the ones attracted who are listening to him, share his intolerance of lack of love. Okay, I understand your question. A and that it's unbearable to us that when we see lack of love being expressed, you know, from the hangnail to the bomb, it's, it's absolutely, utterly unacceptable, and we just right. can't stand it. And I certainly identify with that. So well, what is we your all answer? Do. We all do. So the real question is, how do you go ahead, how do you stand up for what's right? At the same time, you continue to have complete peace of mind. 
put. I mean, if, if, if you notice that your ego is getting involved in this, or whether your ego is not getting involved, maybe you're, all, you're walking a very difficult rope at this, at this particular point, but you can do it. I think that's really the, the example that, that Jesus is, is showing us, that these most incredible, outrageous things can be done to him and to his body. He doesn't see it that way. You know, he doesn't even see himself as they're, they're attacking his body, but he doesn't see it as an attack against his body. That, that there's just a, a kind of a misperception that's going on. And I think King was pretty good about doing that as well. He just realized there was a misperception that was going on. And trust that you're doing the right thing, but don't, you're not attacking. You're just standing up for what's right. And there's a difference between attacking and standing up for what's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brad. The first thing that came to mind when you posed that question is the first thing in the Course. Chapter 1, the first thing, no there are no level of order of difficulties and miracles. Yes. So there's no level of an error or sin. So a, a mother mm -hmm. slapping a child is really no different than uh, mass raping, so to speak, or like the, the things that you were just referring to. So we've got to look at them as they're all as easily removed or corrected because there's no levels in e either the miracle or the error. There's, going back to King, there's a, I tell a story in Living in Courts and Miracles about King. It's a really great story, but he was he was so dis he was going to do a march, and there were threats against his life, and not just his life, but the life of his family, and etc. So he was really in a quandary about what he should do and he couldn't sleep so he gets up in the middle of the night <coughs> and he goes to his kitchen table and he sits down in the dark and he does hell you know what 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 am I going to do and the answer is he just hears <coughs> don't be afraid go ahead don't be afraid just go ahead and don't be afraid which is what he did he went on with and he, of course he got killed later on, but that was the right thing for him to do, right? right. 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 Even, in, even in that sense, it was, that was not the wrong thing. Right. Okay, let's go ahead with this a little bit then. So our function, what is our function? We're talking about what our function is, and I, we just said it, it's, it's forgiveness. <clears throat> Another way that um, I understand what our function is, is I think that I, I talked about having cancer um, very briefly. I had cancer uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. <clears throat> and um, it spread, it, it started off as colon cancer and then it spread to my limb system. And um, when they came to tell me that it had gone into my limb system, uh, that's words you never want to hear is the cancer is spread, you know. And I, they did it when I was in this kind of um, in-between world state, um, when the anesthesia hadn't worn off yet, which I think they do on purpose. <laughs> so that you, you know, it's not quite such a shock to your system. But at four o'clock the next morning, I'm wide awake and I'm very much aware of what <laughs> the news is, and then I started thinking about the fact that I'm going to live uh, somewhat longer, at least maybe a year, or certainly so, more, so many men, more months, or, and definitely days, definitely, and so I get thinking, well, what does it mean to die? And it just means letting go, and so what I'm going to do in this time that I got left, and then what it was is I just have to be the most loving person I can, so the next person walks through the door, and yeah. the next person walks through the door, and the next person walks through the door. And that's it, and that's really, that's our function. That's really the only function that we've all got. And that's really sanity, that's really not going crazy and fighting and resisting, but just saying it, it's okay. Of course, obviously, I didn't die. Yeah, Diane. This is a big problem if we are to, if our function is to love, right. to forgive, whatever, um, I thought loving and loving the person who comes in or, or it's loving is natural, but that forgiveness is something 
that I have to go inside and ask the Holy Spirit to undo the error. So is my function to go to the Holy Spirit to undo the error of believing that I'm separate and even capable of having these thoughts that I'm having right now and extend that onto another person? Is that my function or is my function to just uh, be loving? How do I wake up from the dream by just being loving? instead of undoing the error. I know it sounds confusing, but I'm... No, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, well, it could be either way. I mean, if, if you're already open and you're already loving, then you don't have to go to the Holy Spirit to ask for help with this. But on the other hand, if you're fe feeling some resistance and there's some difficulty probably, then you do need to go to the Holy Spirit and ask for, for help and guidance with it. It just depends on where you're at within your own mind. You may just already be there. If you're not already there, then you've got to ask for help. Great. Eric? Uh, I, I think it goes to state of mind for both of them. Uh, um, when we're in a good state of mind, when we have peace of mind or happy presence, uh, then we're still going to be doing things in the world because we're oh, seem sure. to be here to be doing things in the world. But it's from that vantage point, not from that a lacking vantage point where that they really did things to me, and it's really bad, and they should be punished. I mean, that's the ego going into the past, saying, bringing more to it. Something may have to be addressed, but if it's addressed from a happy presence or peace of mind, there isn't. And then, but you did that last year, and that was wrong, and that didn't work, and it's your fault. That's attack. That's attacking. Uh, but doing something to correct something in the future the, the past cannot be corrected, and there is, and it's only attack to go back to somebody and say, "And you did this, and I saw it, and you were wrong." That that is uh, not any part of what book is talking about. Right. It's always finding a loving response. <laughs>